everybody. It's good to see you all. And it's really good to be here. I see a bunch of new faces, which is always wonderful. And seeing familiar faces is um, wonderful too. So most of you, I believe, are familiar with the Arts Cafe Mystic. I'm Lisa Starr. I'm the current artistic director of the Arts Cafe. I'm glad that my predecessor, Christy Williams, and his predecessor, Melanie Greenhouse, are here. Of course, they would miss it. Um, as most of you know, we had a, we're in our 28th year, and we spent the first 27 and a half of those years at the Arts Cafe, at the um, Mystic Museum of Art. And for a number of reasons, um, including how difficult it was to access the parking lot, um, the fact that we couldn't have baked goods and coffee. Um, uh, it was time to look elsewhere. And we have been looking elsewhere for quite some time with our hearts set on hopefully relocating to the LaGrua Center here in Stonington. Um, to our great delight, uh, Dan Brandle, who is here somewhere, and Kelly LaRoche, um, Dan is the executive director, and Kelly, Kelly um, does so much of the administrative work and the programming. Um, they welcomed us with open arms. So this is our first event here, and um, I don't need to say much about how great this room feels or how nice it is to be here. We are so grateful for your support, Dan, and we are honored and thrilled to be here and to continue to bring literature, poetry, and music from the Arts Cafe Mystic into this space. So thanks so much for being here. We're gonna, we're gonna dive right into it. Um, uh, so I'm gonna start by introducing Faith Vicinanza, who's our opening voice. Um, I've known Faith for, um, you know how many years? About 30. About 30 years. We were so young then. Um, I met Faith when she and a group of, of women from Litchfield County, uh, Connecticut, came to on retreat to the inn that I was running on Block Island without really knowing that I was a writer. And over the course of the next 15 years, that group of women continued to come on retreat every spring and every fall. So I've known Faith through many, many um, stages of her life, um, including an incredible bike ride from the southernmost point on the East Coast to the northernmost point. Um, Faith is not just an extraordinary and powerful poet, she's a huge advocate for poets. And that's at the heart of, of so much that she does. You know, her bio indicates some of the work that she's done currently. She's the Poet Laureate of Southbury, um, serving as an advocate for the importance of poetry in the community and in the world. And since I've known her, she's been doing that. Back in the day, she was part of the, um, really, uh, the birth of the slam movement in the country and um, performed locally, performed on the national team, performed on the national team that went to other countries. Um, and also hosted um, the National Slam competition in Middletown, um, which was at the time the biggest gathering of poetry in the state of Connecticut. Was that 2002? I can't remember. 2007. 2000. No, it can't be 2007. It was 1997, and it's still the largest gathering ever in the state. Awesome. Great. So um, Faith is going to be reading from her newest chapbook, one of the many things that Faith has done as an advocate for poets. Uh, she created a small press called Hanover Press, and she supported many poets getting their first book out in the world. So it's a, a thrill and an honor and a delight to welcome my friend Faith Vicinanza to the, um, to the podium. Well, it's a thrill and an honor to be welcomed by you um, and to be here this evening. So thank you, Lisa. 
Um, thank you to the program, the volunteers. Uh, it's a pleasure to be included. And as much as I welcome any urge to applaud, we all like to be recognized, I am gonna ask that you hold your applause. I'm only reading for 15 minutes and just enjoy going to the end of the 15 minutes, which would be a pleasure for me. Um, so I, uh, I have a book that's coming out called Breathe. And Breathe is a book about family. And the first chapter of the book is called Father. The second chapter is Brother. The third chapter is Husband, which is actually all the poems that were in a chapbook that was published almost uh, 17, 13 years ago. Um, there's a chapter called Mother and a chapter called Family. So I'm gonna read a little bit from each of them and then I'm going to read a couple poems from my latest chapbook that came out in the fall, which is available on the back table. And I'm going to end with a poem from my chapbook that's coming out in a couple of weeks called Shall We Dance? And we'll, I'll talk about that briefly. So this poem is from the first chapter of the book called Father, and the poem is called Refuge. Refuge, she thought, haven four weeks on the island in winter, a respite, she thought, and from the upstairs bathroom, boot prints in the snow, leading to a window that looks in on the kitchen, but she hasn't been out today. The snow is fresh, the boot prints fresher. It's a safe place, the owner assured her. This time of year, no one sets foot on the island unnoticed. But it isn't the fairy passengers she fears. It is the men already here at the grocery store, post office. There is no calming her out here at the end of this snaking, rutted dirt road on this isolated six acres surrounded by stunted trees that sway and creak incessantly from persistent ocean winds. She phones the owner just before midnight. Why would somebody be out here? Come, please take a look. Arriving, he finds her, kitchen knife in hand, tells her it was just the meter man. There are footprints all up and down the laneway. It's a safe place. In the morning, she'll wake from a few hours of intermittent sleep eyes swollen, stand outside in the cold, repeat a tired mantra. He's dead. He cannot hurt me. The next poem is from the chapter called Brother, and it deals with my uh, brother's suicide. He was only 43, and the first poem is called Wasilla, Alaska, December 12th, 2001. Before they scrape, scrub, disinfect, remove, I want to lie on the kitchen floor, rest my cheek in your blood that streams through the ceiling vent, pools on white linoleum. Friends, family, husband insist, and I stay away until cleaning crews come and leave. Three days, what they cannot get out, they cover linen white Tyvek, stapled to stairs, walls, floors, the vent above and below. When they have done all that they can, I come to your house, now mine. Do not expect so much white. Your empty bedroom, the cold inside of an egg, blown clean. One more for my brother. A study in grief with an epigraph and Yet I still am half in love with pain, with what is imperfect, 
with both tears and mirth, with things that have an end, with life and earth, and this moon that leaves me dark within the door. From Liberty by Edward Thomas. One, she wonders when it will pass, if ever, this feeling broken, when even the bold thread of moonlight that streams silver through wintering trees is a free fall of shattering glass strewn everywhere among the waning meadow grasses, the night sky carnivorous. Two, afternoons like this, slate, a weightlessness to the air. Grief holds fast to gutters, trees, window pane, park bench. A familiar rawness clings to the inside of her mouth, hampers each breath. A subtle longing that will never be satisfied dries to a filmy residue on every living thing, causes eyes to tear. A quick one from the chapter called Mother. Mother, we gather wild raspberries in late afternoon. Your hands always ready to receive. Where the brook widens, water pools cool against the bank. How after all these years have we come to stand on the same side. And a couple of poems from Husband. Some small measure of the man. He learns over the course of our marriage to pursue jumping spiders, daddy long legs, fiddlebacks, even the largest of the resident wolf spiders as they slip under a radiator behind the file cabinet, flash along the door jam until he corners them, scoops them up, puts them outside. He begrudgingly guides carpenter bee, yellow jacket, even wasp to an open door or window, relocates all manner of living thing, except the ticks, of course. Obliging me, he tracks a live frog, a mouse, a flailing bird brought in by the cat. He's been treated more than once for a spider bite turned volcanic, red leaders, running up his arm or leg. Still, he maneuvers the car towards the breakdown lane so I might step out, shake free a diminutive spindly thing to roadside grasses. <clears throat> and I feel like a goddess of destiny for a moment. Even if the man I married ultimately held the choice between life and death in his two hands, grasping the steering wheel. <laughs> First snow. Even in July this last year, you wore a sweater to warm your thinning body. Winter would have been oppressive. It matters little to me, selfish as I am. I still want you here. Let me come with you, I posed as death, took up residence in our living room, waited for you to notice him, then for you to lie down with him. This blustery November day brings down most of the oak's remaining leaves. Dead artifacts of summer congregate in bunches across the lawn, as if huddled against the relentless cold. I cut back the last of the flowers in the front garden, remove leaves scattered like corpses amidst the decay of a still bee and once red sedum. The sky unfastens a sporadic dusting of first snow as I lay down a layer of mulch. There are more gardens to tend, to blanket, keep safe, the way I would have tried to keep you safe until spring. One last poem for my husband, Confession. When I would lie jumbled across the length of you, 
I pretended not to lean to the curve of sorrow's belly, your hand on my knee, your tongue in my mouth, and then we would stumble. Or is it that I stumbled? And nothing ever changed, black, always claiming to be something paler, cherry blossom pink, perhaps, or simply yellow. I do not miss holding myself apart, a defense against your pointed intellect, but I miss your wicked sense of humor. I do not miss wanting something more or thinking there was something more to be wanted. Please forgive me. I was forever too easily distracted by nothing. For this, it is too late to make amends. For the rest of everything, that was broken between us. I forgive us both. And then um, a short poem for my grandson, uh, who I raised until he was eight, when my daughter arbitrarily decided she wanted to be a mother again, who is now back living with me and he's 19. So, uh, <clears throat> Angel. He is five, singing in a tub brimming with bubbles, surrounded by super duper heroes, both genders, some alien, some he fancies himself becoming, his voice a bright wish. <laughs> the next couple of poems are from my latest chapbook called Arturo. Phantom. What there is that remains of us is barren cerulean sky, arctic air, winter stripped trees. How foolish to think we were anything more than breath, impermanent, not sacred, not even a stifled dream. All magic comes at a price, even if it is simply that in those moments we concede all other moments as lacking. Repentant, revered deacon of your church, you retreated, but I am always there. A smile, a touch remembered. I live in that space between what was and what could have been. I will learn to embrace the ordinary, but the ears will not free you, will not let you forget you with me. The imperfect moon. The imperfect moon leans precarious in the carbon overhang of night. In dream, he recalls his lover's simple beauty but it slips from him in the dim light of almost morning. At dawn, he paints the headboard red. In the afternoon, he buys sheets and pillowcases to match. Night after night, in dream, he holds her, her scent remembered, unmistakable, her body warm, protected in his cocoon of red on red. He believes he can fashion her from memory from her whispered endearments that linger in shadow. The last one from, oh, two more from that collection, Kindred. The sun yields to the dark. Each star in turn renounces all light. Each distant planet leaves no lingering trail, not even the Milky Way, all is black, conveying an untimely death in unchoreographed descent. Fireflies she nurtured in a bug jar in her bedroom drop from flight their own light, now mere memory. No match head struck responds, its desperate want of a blaze unrequited. 
And in the dark, she sings a low song, the one she has voiced to no one night after night. This time it reaches you in your groping with what you cannot define in this pitch black obscurity. You hear her song as surely as if she were daybreak her pale heart unwavering, the almost inaudible love, her fingers pressed to lips, yours to silence them. So why then, this time, do you hear her? Two more poems. Uh, one last poem from the Arturo collection. Oh, love, who'd wince then chide when I'd call you by your given name? your father's name, but held vigil when death mouthed it, whispered it, death unflinching in the face of your conviction that you'd outwit him with prayer, death unyielding notwithstanding your belief that you, so young and a man of God could grapple bargain perhaps, clinching hope in your fists, certain he must have mistaken you for another, that last time in your hospital room, that last kiss, the taste of defeat almost sweet on thinned lips, a calm throughout your frail and failing body. So unlike those nights when we shattered presumed boundaries with our lovemaking, moved through each other with such fierceness in defiance of death, who now comes for you nonetheless, too soon, too soon. I'm gonna end on a poem from a collection that's coming out in a couple of weeks called Shall We Dance? Um, three and a half years ago, I had a ruptured kidney. I was facing kidney failure, renal failure, and I ended up in the hospital of uh, five overnight stays in 10 weeks, very, very complications incurred. And as I was recovering, I said, I'm not going out with a whisper, as they say. And I uh, eventually started taking ballroom dance lessons and it's been three years. And I now have a collection coming out of poems I've written over the course of that three years. And the collection is called Shall We Dance? And the poem I'm gonna finish with is, it's hard to dance when you're wearing heavy armor. <clears throat> when I thread my way through the white of the forest, previously untrod snow underfoot, a winter's slate sky, trees laden with white reflect the rising sun as if glass, the feathering white of my breath hangs in the cold air, all near silent, save a faint heartbeat, my own, and that of a snowy owl perched far to the north. The heartbeat, too, of a hidden earth beneath layers of white on white, when I'm standing at last at the water's edge, a veiled shoreline Morning welcomes and I shatter the pristine, slip free of this cloak of lamb's wool, osprey feathers layer upon layer of pale cotton, beads and ivory clasps abandon this heavy armor meant to protect, then kneel, place my warm palm to the iced over edge of a still lake, it comes to life at my touch beneath the retreating light of last night's new moon, a white moon. I step unbound into the cool water, lean into the dance. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. I forgot about that time you rented our house. <laughs>
We had a home on Block Island. That's the first poem. And it was down. The driveway was four tenths of a mile. It was impossible to find it. And, and it was the middle of winter, and we were trying to convince Faith that and she. And it was Lisa who I called before midnight. Oh. It didn't work in the poem to say she. she. <laughs> wow! Thank you so much. What a what a what an amazing compilation. Um, one quick thing, um, Faith has books in the back, as does Philip, um, and uh, we're going to take an intermission after the music. So hopefully you can find a book and help yourself back to the baked goods table. It seems our bakers baketh over, so we're going we're gonna to cut the prices in half and encourage you to buy something and take it home with you. I worked my brother pretty hard today baking all those cookies and brownies, so let's, let's reward David for his efforts. Thank you so much, Faith. Uh, I'm really, really happy to introduce our musical guest, Dr. Wes Chesterson. He has performed at the Arts Cafe before. Uh, he treated us to an evening of Leonard Cohen music. And um, those of us who were there will remember how, how powerfully moving it was. Um, Mark's, uh, Dr. Wes Chesterson's bio tells a little bit about him. One of them lets you know that he's the best known rapper in Western Massachusetts. And he's not kidding. So I would encourage all of you to Google Dr. Wes Chesterson on YouTube and see the two videos that are mentioned in his bio. They are extraordinary. For any of you who know Western Massachusetts, what's the tale? Agawam. Agawam. It's a showcase of Agawam um, featuring multiple cameos by our good friend, the comedian Stephen Wright. Um, so the, the videos are extraordinary and will give you a different taste of what the doctor uh, is capable of. A few of us were at a show that he did at the Knickerbocker about a year and a half ago uh, with a full band celebrating the music of Bob Dylan. Uh, I actually was with him in Malibu about a year and a half ago, and I got to watch him audition one of those uh, Dylan tunes in front of Chris Martin from Coldplay and Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. And the two of them were just looking at each other like, do you believe this guy? So Mark, uh, Dr. S Dr. Wes Chesterson, I'm sorry. I've known the doctor under many previous names. We go way, way, way back to when he was courting one of my chambermaids at the inn that I ran on Block Island. And don't think I didn't see you sneaking in and out. And, um, and uh, he's a brilliant master of his own musician. And I'm so glad that after years of helping other people get their starts and cultivating other people and helping them produce their own music, he has taken it upon himself to create a new album. He does, in fact, have real albums here. Um, he'll tell you a little bit more about how you can download the new album, which is called A Modern mm, Better Days Ahead, which he refers to as a modern day yacht rock masterpiece. So, um, with no further ado, let me welcome Dr. Wes Chesterson to the front and center. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want to say first off how much I love Lisa Starr. So thanks, Lisa, for always including me in and stuff, because it's so much fun. Um, yeah, Lisa, I, I, I am a rapper. I'm not doing that tonight. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> I asked Lisa what she wanted me to do this time, and she said, do your own stuff. And I said, okay. And then she said, do whatever you want. I said, okay. Um, so I'm gonna warm up with a uh, song, a Tom Waits song, um, because I just found out that, that this uh, album turned 50 years old last week. And uh, it's a very, it's low in my register, so I get to warm up with it. So I hope you enjoyed this.
which really was a whole lot of fun uh, for all of us, uh, particularly myself. I actually lost both my folks to the COVID right in the first part of it. They got the OG strain, the real one, not the, you know, not the uh, Omicron, the Delta, none of that stuff for my folks. <coughs> good stuff. Uh, but anyways, I was determined to take that and kind of make something beautiful out of it. So that's what this album is. And uh, this is actually the song, I'm gonna play a couple songs from you now. The first one is, uh, it's actually the last song that I wrote, um, but it kind of sums the whole thing up. So anyways, uh, this one's called uh, Postcards from the Play. Baby got on her 
understand the song. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Not a great carpentry, but that's the point. Anyway, uh, Thanksgiving went off without a hitch. Turkey was great, gravy was awesome. And then I wrote this song a little bit after that. Um, so this one's called Thanksgiving Day. Wild free. 
All right, here we are again. Let's, um, let's start with a round of applause, please, for Faith and for Dr. Westchesterson. I had no idea your real name was Mark. Um, so b b before I introduce Philip with great honor, um, I do need to thank again uh, uh, Dan and Kelly here at the LaGrua Center. And I also need to thank my astonishing board, my amazing board of directors and uh, the crew of volunteers. Um, I work for the most incredible board of directors and they couldn't have proved it more in this last month as they've helped me hold together a show while um, many other things in my life were requiring my attention. So I've had people toting equipment, baking, hanging posters, following up on things that I wasn't able to. So to each and all of you, my gratitude. I'd like to acknowledge them all by name and back. We've got our board president, John Sutherland, with Susan and Janet Sutherland. Jim Marshall has filmed every show that we've had for the last 28 years <laughs> without fail. I've got Christy Williams and Kate Moffitt. Uh, Christy has done so much, and Kate too, for this show. Um, Bill Moffitt, I don't know how we could have coffee without you. I'm so glad you made it back from Belize. When I heard you were going, I thought we might never see you again. <laughs> uh, Liz Raisbeck, again, toting equipment to and from the Groton Library for me, being here to help set up. Wendy Halsey was here earlier. She's got family in town, so she needed to scoot, but she was greeting most of you at the door. Melanie Greenhouse, who was the original director of the Arts Cafe, never fails to show up early and stay till the very end. And I would also like to thank Nan Hardigan, uh, a great friend of the Arts Cafe Mystic, who is... Um, putting Phil up in some pretty splendid digs tonight. Um, I think he's wishing he might be staying an extra day, but he's got a dog to go home to. Uh, also, many thanks to all of you for being here. Many of you are donors to the Arts Cafe, and we need your support, and we count on it, and we love it when you're here to celebrate the events that you help us create. You all know who you are. I know who you are. So thank you. Now we get to hear from Philip Schultz. Um, I gotta tell you, Philip, the first two people here were here before the doors even opened and they are ready to hear you read. So I'm gonna get you up here pretty quickly. Phillips received just about every award that a, a poet could receive. Um, the bio in the, uh, in the program is uh, enormously condensed version. So the Guggenheim, the Fulbright, a national endowment for the Arts Fellowship, they go on and on and on and on. Failure won the 2008 Pulitzer Prize, and I believe the last time you were here was shortly after the publication. Uh, is that right, Christy? Is that... that was the first time. That was the first time. Okay. So we are so glad to have you back. We've got, um, we've got two books of Phillips, um, Comforts from the Abyss and uh, Luxury in back. Uh, Philip will be signing books after the reading and will also be uh, available you know, for a few questions and answers after his reading. So we welcome you. You are a kind and beautiful man and I am so honored to finally meet you face to face and to have shared a meal with you a gift of a lifetime. Thanks, Philip, for joining us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I think this is the fourth time, yes. And um, it's also a pleasure to be reading to live people. I'm so used to Zoom readings. 
And um, in what they have a new thing called Zoom hybrid readings. That means that you read from your home to in Buffalo, say, and someone, the poet in Buffalo, actually appears in person. And um, it ha you you need technology, and if the technology isn't good, I, the person reading me by Zoom is projected onto a screen, so everyone gets confused. <laughs> and at at one point, I someone was talking to me as if I were there and saying, "We're going to go out for coffee afterwards or drinks." <laughs> Probably wasn't coffee. I think at that point we all needed a drink. Anyways, it's a real pleasure to be here, and and thank you all for um, inviting me. Uh, Comforts of the Abyss is a memoir. It's, but part of the memoir, part of my story, is a school I started, a uh, creative writing school that is now, this is the 37th year. And um, there's somebody here who was here, was, was part of that school when um, it met live in my living room in, in the village. Now everything is by Zoom, and we can have eight different time zones. So you have students from Rome and from San Francisco and Tucson, and, which is wonderful, but it's Zoom. You, don't, you can't go out for coffee afterwards. Keep saying coffee. Um, Comforts of the Abyss, I'm going to read a few sections from it. Um, just a paragraph in, uh, here. The writing process is seldom logical, and writers of any seriousness often enough see themselves as unabridged and curious creatures, desirous of the very thing they fear most, exposure of any kind. I know now that if I'm not made uncomfortable by something I'm writing, I'm probably not saying anything of value. That true emotional connection almost always creates anxiety. Why else would I need to investigate every thought and act, remain stubbornly suspicious of every desire and surprise, of even my very motivation to create? Isn't it only reasonable that I should feel like a stranger to myself, knowing that the excitement I seek in revelation is matched with dread of equal, if not superior, strength? That this is what the great project of creative thinking is all about, finally, knowing and revealing our incapacities and most intimate thoughts in a cautionary tale we tell ourselves when we think no one else is listening. Isn't this what all the masters were about to? Henry James, Tolstoy, George Eliot, Shakespeare, Gerard, Manley Hopkins, and most certainly Walt Whitman, performing on their psyche surgeries of such magical persuasion, they were willing to bring forth what they may have perceived as shameful and pathetic to disrupt their most intimate sense of privacy and contentment. Yes, this, this is interesting. It sounds like it follows, and it's 30 pages long, 30 pages later. It's not 30 pages long. It's a paragraph. <laughs> yes, this is why, despite my fear that others will see me as weird, absurd, or obscene, I insist on pursuing so fully and semi-consciously, abjectly, and willingly every creative instinct adding yet another rumor, whisper, image, or anecdote to this ongoing, illicit, often preposterously precious spilling of the beans, that despite the little black bird perched on my shoulder, reminding me constantly of the thousand and one reasons to remain silent, when my desire to create is greater than my fear, I find the strength to pursue the truth about whatever it is I truly feel under all my lies and obfuscations, and then know how to proceed. And that even when the fear is too great and I stop and never want to write again, it isn't a lack of strength of will that has stopped me or a matter of fault or blame. It is the comforts of the abyss that have stopped me, the lies and convenient truths that hide just below the level of my consciousness, behind which I seek refuge and blindness. And even if I can go no further, I now know something about myself 
that I wouldn't have attained any other way, something that will help me with future projects. In writing this book, I tried to understand why it is I really wrote. I always wanted to be a novelist. I didn't read a lot. I was dyslexic. I didn't read a lot of poetry. I didn't read a lot, but I, I didn't have much of a relationship with poetry. And yet, all my novels amounted to absolutely nothing. And every time I wrote a poem, somebody published it. And I would end up resenting them for that. <laughs> if an, an editor would reject, would, would take me on as a poet, and then I would immediately give them a novel, and they would, of course, reject it. And I would be so pissed off that I wouldn't want to give them any more poetry. <laughs> I destroyed beautiful relationships with wonderful editors because of that. But finally, when I got married and my wife asked me to write a poem for our wedding, she, she's a sculptor and she wrote something and I wrote something. It was, damn, it was a poem. And I started writing poetry and she saw me as a poet. So I, for the first time, became a poet. Um, this, this scene involves Norman Mailer. We became friends for all kinds of strange reasons I still don't understand. And um, I guess because we were, you know, I was a street kid and life was kind of dangerous and I was, you know, everything was like a game of chicken and we, he liked that in me and we did that. And here is we took a walk behind his house in Stockbridge up in the mountains and we saw a big cliff and we just looked at each other, smiled and turned it into a game of chicken. We were tired of running toward the end of the cliff and I was doing well, I'll read it. I was doing it so seriously, it frightened both of us. In an instant, without hesitating, we began running full out toward the edge that overhung the valley below in an unannounced game of chicken that had only one rule, the first to stop before going over the edge lost. As a kid, I almost never lost a game of chicken, maybe because losing meant the kind of spectacular humiliation all us first-generation kids knew only too well, the shame of never being good enough the kind of lifelong captivity that required constant renovations of the self. Norman was also first generation. His father was born in South Africa, coming here by way of Cleveland, by way of England, his mother the daughter of a rabbi, and many of his personas were designed to prove that he was no longer a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, which is perhaps why Hemingway's persona of masculine vainglory served us both so well. And now we're both running all out toward what looked like the edge of the world, our breath exploding, the same absurdly wild smile on both our faces in a contest that depended entirely on the concept that losing wasn't a possibility. But he was nearly twice my age and with a belly not made for sprinting, which is, which is what we were doing now, sprinting toward the heavens on a glorious fall day, each lost somewhere in the fog of his own and each other's ego system, wanting not only to win, but to beat and render the other a loser. And I was loving the idea that I was faster and didn't even pause to consider where my momentum was taking me until with one foot hanging suspended in midair over the edge, this is true, and, and the realization of impending doom suddenly fogging my vision, Norman reached out, grabbed my shirt, and yanked me back, both of us falling to the ground and then rolling over ourselves. Wildly panting and roaring with laughter, he yelled, you crazy motherfucker, you are going over. You know that? You're a fucking maniac. <laughs> Hard to write about that in poetry. <laughs> and, um, okay, another, he, he, um, he took me skiing. He decided, he was a skier because Hemingway had been a skier, so um, he took me and I, of course, had never skied before, had no idea or even desire to do that. And he took me and he introduced me to the baby slope because I was supposed to learn how to ski. And here I was with all these 10-year-olds. And I watched him go off to the advanced slope. 
And after a while, I became indignant, and I asked what the next slope was, and they said the intermediate, and so I made my way over to the intermediate. This picks up um, with my actually somehow getting myself up there on the chairlift and not dropping the skis. I slowly and clumsily made my way over to the edge where I looked down the very steep slope at all the skiers gliding down the white earth in graceful patterns that seemed designed to make them come close to one another without ever colliding. Perhaps it was time, I thought, to turn around and confess my mistake and return, my right, return to my rightful place on the baby slope. <laughs> but several impatient-looking people were standing behind me, and the idea of appearing cowardly and retreating was too embarrassing. How bad could things get, I told myself. I enjoyed a good sense of balance, and even if I fell down a few, bad, few times, how bad could that be? Norman would never know about it. <laughs> So using the defense that I didn't know any better, I did what all us kids in the old neighborhood would do. I flung myself over the edge onto what appeared to be the beginning of an endless expanse of sheer white ice. <laughs> Fighting the impulse to shut my eyes, I suddenly found myself heading straight down the slope without any sense of, or knowledge of how to do what everyone in front of me clearly knew how to do, a side-to-side -side movement. Norman later explained, Norman later explained was called traversing that allowed one to control not only their speed but the angle of descent. But every time I tried to move sideways, I nearly fell down and then terrified and not knowing what to do with my poles, uh, one got stuck in the snow and became unattached from my wrists and flew out of my hand, nearly hitting a man skiing off to my left. And now, recognizing my complete ineptitude, everyone in front of me was trying to get out of my way, lunging, <laughs> lunging forward and to the side, one or two falling down and cursing me, each and every one yelling instructions I couldn't or didn't want to hear. And then two patrol guys were suddenly on either side of me, yelling at me to fall down, just fall down, which I very much wanted to do, shifting my weight from side to side and lunging forward, but everything I did only increased my speed. <laughs> which is when the guy to my left tried to knock my ski out from under me, while the one on my right bumped against me hard, knocking my right ski off, which we all watched fly into the air, nearly hitting an older man frantically trying to escape. So now, skiing with one pole and one ski, going ever faster while the patrol guys continued to yell instructions at me, we all headed straight down toward a group of people standing at the bottom of the slope, watching us descend toward them as if out of a dream. And then, maybe only a few feet from these now scattering people, one of the guards managed to knock me over, and I fell to the ground, my one ski flying off into the sky, and then rolled the rest of the way down the hill until I finally came to a stop in a large mound of snow where Norman was standing looking down at me. <laughs> Turn around and look at your handiwork. He said, pointing at the slope behind me where a good number of bodies were strewn in various states of reconstitution and surrender, a few glaring down at me. I have only one question, he said. Why did you settle for this slope and not take on the advanced one? <laughs> it wasn't a question that required an answer and I didn't give him one. <laughs> should have called the book, the book The Adventures of a Street Kid. Um, th this, next, this next and last section is um, uh, my favorite poet was Elizabeth Bishop. I just loved her work. And it's, it's astounding to think that she published 80 poems in her lifetime. I mean, I have friends who can do that in a month. <laughs> Well, not quite a month, maybe two. But it's amazing that, that she worked so hard on, a, on, a, on every one of her poems. And um, the editor of the poetry, uh, the editor of the New Yorker, um, the poetry editor once told me that the only way he could get poems out of her was to fly from New York to Cambridge to visit her and to go to her apartment, go to her desk, 
when she was panicking and look through her work and plead with her for this poem or this poem. And all her poems appeared only in The New Yorker, and that's because he had the foresight and the will to do it, and because she didn't believe in sending things out. Anyway, this is, I met her once. You can't call it meeting because I was so intimidated and awestruck that I couldn't open my mouth. But in, I lived in San Francisco, and two friends who had been students of hers invited her to a party. And um, just, just to set that up, it was a birthday party, uh, uh, although no one knew it, for the host, for the, for the guy. And, um, and she was the prize guest. And he was in a sour mood. He was always in a sour mood. And, but he was particularly depressed this evening. And here, so the wife came over to um, Elizabeth and asked her if she could possibly cheer him up. Which is when, as if to rescue me, the wife of my host friend came over to ask Bishop if there wasn't something she could do to improve her husband's mood. He was, in fact, sulking at his own birthday party, since she, Elizabeth, was something of a magician, after all. Smiling generously, Bishop asked for a newspaper, and being, and, and being given one, quickly tore off a page and began with the alacrity and skill that seemed nothing less than miraculous, folding it into the figure of a bird. Yes, a life-size a life -size newspaper bird that actually looked as if it could fly of its own power. We all, we all, we were all staring at her and it, and now because it, this magical paper being, did seem to be coming to life before our eyes. It was a performance unlike any I'd ever witnessed. And now, having finished creating it, she took a cigarette lighter out of her purse and pausing to smile at her audience, called my friend over in a voice no larger, louder, or more commanding than that of a small girl. He, my friend, who had been standing nearby watching along with all the rest of us, now came over to stand obediently before her, as curious as he was perhaps concerned. What role, after all, could he possibly be playing in all this? Glancing around at her enraptured audience, she paused only to smile first at my friend and then at the paper bird, both of whom seemed anxious for the next act to commence. And then, with a snap of her thumb, she lit the lighter, and then the bird, which seemed of its own volition to float up into the air, its wings aglow with fire. As if choreographed to do so, we all stepped back in unison to see the paper bird hover high above her head, its tiny wings robustly flapping in what perhaps was a sudden breeze bestowed upon it and us by some indigenous god who just happened to be passing by and, like all the rest of us, became so enthralled as to forget whatever else had occupied her. Along with all the rest of us, my friend was laughing and clapping his hands and then dancing from foot to foot as if he too had been set on fire and transformed into someone entirely new and happier. I remember a little of what followed, only that I could barely bring myself to look her way. I had stood the whole night eavesdropping on her. And my friends tried to introduce me, I wouldn't let them. Fearing, I, um, and, and when I did glance at her, she was sitting there in her overstuffed chair, smiling a smile of pure contrition, as if she too, along with all the rest of us, was awestruck by her own wizardry. Was this expression after she, was this her expression after she completed writing one art? It's a great poem. And was too exhausted by the effort to feel anything other than some small sense of wonder and pride? In any case, she now had successfully completed her chore and could enjoy the results. My friend's mood, along with everyone else's, had been, for the foreseeable future, very much improved. I'm going to read some poems from Luxury. Three. IGA. <clears throat> it's one week after Sandy and Mrs. Cobb, our mailman's aunt, who lived in a Halloween house on Cheryl Road that burned down, is ahead of me in line, hands in her hair, screaming. 
Betsy, the cashier, is telling the assistant manager, Peggy, that all she did was say her peaches aren't the ones on sale. <laughs> Mr. Brim, the sourpuss who owns the pizzeria on North Main, yells from behind me, just give her the damn peaches. A dead deer's on my garage. My backyard's a lake. We're all still at my sister-in-law's and I'm not hollering my head off. I offer to pay and Betsy snorts, you? Because two years ago, I refused to make a third donation to her Baptist choir and her God isn't the forgiving kind. <laughs> now Rudy, the manager is here, angry not to be among his friends, the chips and donuts in aisle six. Good, Mr. Brim groans. Now everyone's here. Actually, almost everyone is here. JJ, the Delhi air drummer who hums R&B and slices everything thin. Fergus, the cart gatherer whose tattoos depict angry biblical patriarchs. And Benny and Produce who lost 84 pounds eating sardines and cocoa puffs and has iPhone photos to prove it. All come to see if this is just another catastrophe that will keep us up all night, watching our kids sleep in the living room, praying for the wind to stop, the roof to hold, that last insurance bill got paid, fearing our ignorance and pettiness is to blame. That if we were just a little more humble in the hearing and sublime in the doing, as St. Augustine suggested, we could all go back to sleep, only one donation, and the right peach shy of deliverance. <laughs> the kiss. I, I, let, let me say I read this poem at some local thing in East Hampton where, where we live and um, the people who were the poems about were present and there was a lot of crying. <laughs> The Kiss for Jack Chiglick and Manuel Fernandez Castellero. In a sense, Jack and Manuel were starting over again. Jack, a Romanian Jew who designed our house, drank our kids' concoctions made out of everything on a restaurant's table, which we wouldn't do, and Manuel, who shared his amazement at a perplexing world while surviving Cuba, communism, and AIDS, got married at City Hall not, all, not long after two men could. To help them celebrate, Monica and I brought a fancy bottle of champagne we could never find a reason to open before. As is the custom, we kissed after my toast while they just looked at each other, curiously. Never in public before, Jack said. Okay. I know what it feels like to see myself through the harsh light of another's eyes, to be the other. Suddenly, we were they and they us, if you know what I mean. I mean objectified. Relax, there's no point to be made. Even notarized, love is never normal or wise, and no one knows how to behave or hasn't felt despised. It doesn't matter that my toast was celebratory, that I'm saying now what I couldn't say then. What matters is they kissed finally, quite elegantly, and we all enjoyed the splendid dinner Jack made. Okay, that, that's... Uh, here are some new poems, and I'm grateful to all of you because a couple of them, especially the last one, was finished, I hope, um, for this event. The first one's called The Art of Wailing. It's a quote from Lao Tzu. He who shows himself is not conspicuous. The way is forever nameless. Oh, and, and I'll just quickly say there's a big debate in East Hampton now. The new mayor, the new mayor oh. wants to do away with, we have a crew of ambulance workers who are all volunteers and wonderful human beings. And he wants to get rid of them all and substitute that with something he calls more efficient. I don't know how this poem, which side this poem falls on. <laughs> Jim, older and apparently in worse shape than me, is swearing as he bangs my stretcher against the back of the ambulance. 
Billy, the young driver, laughs as he kindly slides me inside, where Betsy, a retired librarian, my son's love, recalls hearing me read a poem about pumpernickel that made her hungry. Let her, Jim says, and she'll talk you to death. <laughs> well, Betsy says, you failed a stress test. No big thing, a stent or two, relax. Now we're running traffic lights, the whaling reaching all the way to high sea. You'll get fentanyl, she sings, might be inspiring. <laughs> if he writes one, Jim snorts, you'll be in it. <laughs> turn out to be true. Your wife has sculpture at the Nature Conservancy, Betsy adds, where I also volunteer. I myself volunteer for nothing, my charity remembering everything. I love poetry, she laughs, but it gives me headaches. Hang in there, fellow, Jim Weeks, we're almost there. Outside the back windows, a flock of pink clouds spell out a line by Lao Tzu. Governing a large state is like boiling a small fish. <laughs> yes, if mishandled, both fail miserably. The wailings now a medley of Dylan's rasping loneliness, Monk's joyous annoyances and reckonings, Elvis rocking my jailhouse loose of all my precious bitterness. Oh, life, forgive my stumbling, back alley escapes into respectability, my endless cacophony of unleavened regret and longing. Please, one hour more of my wife and son's glorious paradox, tragic mistakes, pirated iTunes and Wikipedia, of being my own favorite pursuit, the obliging malevolent prospects of Jacob hidden in Esau's clothes, all our birthrights forever out of reach. Oh, life, thank you for this nameless, beautiful, ungovernable, small pink fish. My neighbor, Ed, I just found this out. I'm getting my watch battery replaced in our hardware store when I asked their watch guy, Mark, about my neighbor, Ed, who works here and whose car I haven't seen in his driveway in months. Ed's dead, Mark says. Smoking killed him three months ago. Surprised by how aggrieved I am, I stammer something about how Ed lived around the corner from me on a small side street for over 20 years and ask why I didn't see an obit anywhere. Smiling, Mark says, well, you know Ed was a grouch and someone has to volunteer to write one. <laughs> yes, he complained of anyone parked near his tired house got angry every time my son skateboarded down the street and never once said hello when I walked my dog past him. During the pandemic, I tried being nice, smiling and once complimenting his new old Jeep, to which he scowled, it's a vehicle, not a car. <laughs> I, it still pisses me off. <laughs> Yes, his sullenness was as familiar as our mailman's truck, and the familiar is a backdrop against which the riddle of our lives play out. He had a son, I say, and Mark said yes, but no one here ever saw him, and Ed never said anything about him. The old woman with wild white hair always tending his garden, was she his wife or mother? My wife believed his wife, I his mother. Sighing, Mark said, they weren't related. He took care of him for room, he took care of her for room and board. Then I ask Ed's last name. Silent a long time, Mark shrugs, Cobb, I think. Which strikes both of us as absurd and maybe a bit tragic. His coworker and my neighbor and neither of us know his last name. Now, wandering around our lovely village, I'm wondering why I'm so stricken about someone I didn't know. Am I mourning the stranger in me, the hidden secret self who seldom offers acknowledgement? Suddenly, every passing face seems to be hiding something they themselves can't recognize. My neighbor, Ed, I'm grateful for the light in your kitchen window every night, your proud vehicle in your driveway each crack, shingle, and scrap of window plastic for the gift of knowing someone lived here among the richer vacant houses in all that ominous silence, living your life as best you could, enjoying perhaps what remained of your brief, mysterious, and nameless journey just around the corner from where I live mine. 
Um, I have time for two more, I hope. Um, this is called Good News. It's a, it's a candidate, the title is a candidate for the name of a new book I'm trying to put together. Waking from a dream I don't want to remember, I turned to an old movie on TV called Good News, in which Peter Lawford, playing a football hero, is kissing June Ellis and his French tutor, tentatively, because, well, who isn't worried about what lies ahead? Yes, what lies ahead? Here I am, a 78-year-old man, dealing with the after effects of radiation and other maladies, embedded in a community of nervous insomniacs, seeking diversion from a relentless bad news. Annihilated hospitals, wailing mothers, earthquakes, school shootings, and migrants hiding in garbage trucks. Okay, bad news gets more attention because we're all relieved it's happening elsewhere to someone else which is bad news soaked and very bad. This movie, made in 1947, two years after Endless War, is valiantly trying to point a way forward. June and Peter are now being swung around a glittering dance floor by young people ecstatic about what lies ahead. Without a doubt, the younger me would now be hopping over sofas, celebrating each lucid moment of precious sanity. A week ago, wearing a cap and gown, our youngest son skied down a Vermont hill, happily embracing his future, while two weeks before, the wing of a plane his best friend's father was in broke off, and the future also drowned. As we speak, surveillance balloons are exploding above us. Innocents everywhere are being sacrificed for reasons that want nothing to do with us. While Peter and June, alongside my son, are skiing down a hill in caps and gowns, seeking the good news embedded in the bad, the wellsprings of knowledge, the smallest scrap of certainty, whatever remains stubbornly buoyant and unbroken. I'm gonna read this um, last poem. I have to say, dear Christy was very supportive and I promised I would, so I can't chicken out now. <laughs> My um, ex-editor, a dear friend who's gone over it with me, who's 96 now, um, says, I finally written my novel. Now, don't fear, it's only a page and a half, but, um, or a little more, but um, she sees it as a, okay, anyway, I, I, it's stuff I've never been able to deal with in this way. Whew, something and nothing. The world, Schopenhauer said, is driven by blind, dissatisfied will seeking satisfaction, the cause, purpose, and essence of something. Yes, and we all know that the opposite of something is essentially nothing, which is what Dad bequeathed us after he died and Mom and I returned to Grandma's house deep in the inner city, shrunken and disgraced. Nothing, he believed, was the value of life, the endless pursuit of what cannot be attained. In other words, suffering and restless strife. Buried under boxes of Uncle Jake's girly books in the attic, a first edition of Schopenhauer's essay spoke to me as nothing before, about fragrant, splintered ideas making the same mistakes over and over again. Oddly enough, I found all this encouraging, a framework for despair, for suffering. All those devastating wars, the worship of hatred and moral decay, the history of civilization stained only occasionally with benevolence. Yes, he believed in sympathy toward others, if not ourselves, and inspired and encouraged the genius of thinking. But how would he have perceived mom returning to the same filing job she had before she married dad? once again watching the big clock hand crawl around the smaller one until it was time to take the number four bus back to the same house where she and I were born in the same stink of rusted engines and gurgling toilets in the junkyard beyond our fence. The same rat seeking refuge in our dirt cellar. Her standing late each night at the icebox eating cereal and blueberry ice cream, trying to forget her boss calling her Lil something and everyone laughing. No, something was his idea of compassion, not endless sacrifice. The something mom believed in was me, which too often felt like a burden, a responsibility. 
We shall leave this world as foolish and as wicked as we found it, Schopenhauer quoted Voltaire as saying. Okay, but for me the world was the gum bumps under my third grade desk, the spinning red stool tops at the model diner each school day, where I ate alone among the hungry eyes from Bonds, Kodak, and DuPonts, the icy Genesee Falls I skipped rocks off playing hooky every day, hiding inside Jake's boxes of T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, and W.B. Yeats, where I learned truth bequeaths the fragile chemistry of satisfaction, and grief and even deprivation can be a symphony conscious performs in our dreams, that poverty isn't a weakness nor shame a legacy. Something the Saturday nights when dad and his four brothers danced the Gazatsky, arms folded and chests heaving, knowing everything, every minute of every day is up for grabs. The July morning, my draft board agreed I was too crazy, crazy to go to Vietnam, mom and I laughing shamefully. The Academy Awards every year are sitting deep in the dark because Uncle Jake paid all the bills and we couldn't waste his electricity. Everyone so beautiful, hugging and kissing. Mom wearing red lipstick, her best blue dress with shiny buttons and fake silver earrings. Dad snoring in the bedroom behind us, too tired to care about all those phony big shots. Grandma sleeping, sitting up on her pullout sofa, dreaming of Lithuanian weddings. All of us believing for these few moments that dignity isn't an entitlement. Goodness doesn't mean being good. Justice would be my inheritance. Yes, underneath everything, something stretched like our backyard sycamores, way above what they saw of us down here on our knees, weaning color out of our gardens, clutching rakes, hammers, one another, improvising soliloquies about never standing still long enough to feel ungrateful or mortified, new snow and walloping high winds tucked under their branches as they read the sky's journal one cloud at a time. Yes, always somewhere deep inside our appetite for something larger, finer, more curious than ourselves, our belief in the present moment, climbing our dreams one step closer to the sorrow our story told without a narrator or design about how we made ourselves out of nothing but something inside the sweet secret joy in mom's eyes all those New Year's Eve deep in Times Square, counting the seconds left until the future exploded and she lifted me high into the frozen air like the prize she always expected, all of us welcoming the whirling, jubilant, unwielding torrents of our desire for applause and recognition for the world of honor and blessed mediocrity, the infinite beauty of instinct and self-esteem, for how one reason fits so exquisitely into the next, how our animal nature belongs to the union, the rendering, the perfection of love's qualities, the whole course of history awakening in us each morning, each night, the reason, the verdict, the dancing while reciting Pushkin between swallows of vodka, our right leg stretched out straight and vibrating until Saturday morning when it's showing up bright and early to get kicked all the way back to Sunday to Monday, which as we speak stands waving its red lamp at the far end of eternity like a Cossack singing dance, dance, dance for all your for all your worth, which is nothing, not a goddamn thing, Lord. Seven hundred and sixty nine drafts, I believe. <laughs> so I just knocked it off. And thank you. I, I read this with all of you in mind, re reading it fin to finish it here. So thank. Oh, do I stay up here now, or? Um, anybody have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Why the hell did you write that one? <laughs> yeah. Tell me about your wife's sculpture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could go to uh, monicabanks.com. You can go to, you can go and look at it. It's monicabanks.com. Um, she's wonderful. It's, um, she's now doing um, ceramic porcelain cakes made out of 
she had a sculpture in the middle of Times Square for 15 years, which was 30, which was 34 faces. It was uh, no 34 tons, and it was 15 faces, I believe. And I was one of them, and I was the one that the cabs all hit. Um, <laughs> She did our dogs, me, and, and a couple of friends. And she's now doing these cakes with um, the bottom, the top comes off, and there's a room with chairs and beds. There's, some of them have dead rats on top of them. So she, it, the idea is to mix celebration and dread. But they're original, they're wonderful. Um, MonicaBanks.com, you could see her, that's her website. She has three shows coming up. She's pretty damn good. Where is she showing? Well, she has a gallery in New York in there. It's um, Catherine Markell. It's in Chelsea. And um, she shows at the Longhouse, and she has a show in the fall, and um, Sarah Nightingale, um, uh, the Lieber House, if you've ever heard of that, which is, you would all love it. You, you know, with that, it's all these, this woman, the Holocaust survivor, made all these incredible, exquisite purses. And um, this a whole museum is dedicated to these. She, she did one a year, and they would be a sensation. And um, there's a whole, and they have a garden, and they have, Monica has clouds, and she would hang clouds or um, made out of copper wires. And... Vivian, this is why you bring friends. <laughs> what you just read is for a book, I assume. Yes, yes. And, but how close to getting it finished are you? I mean the book? Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm taking a little longer than I, um, I, I just, this, the, the, the memoir just came out this year, last, last June. The paperback isn't out. It's going to be out this summer. So it, it was a while when I wasn't writing poetry. Um, so I, um, it'll probably be a couple of years at least. I, I have, I never know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you. Um, okay. Listen. Thank you. Wow, what a great start for the Arts Cafe Mystic at La Grue Center. Philip, thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a powerful and riveting reading and humble, really humble. So thank you. Faith, good doctor, Mr. Schultz, thank you so much for blessing our inaugural event. Uh, my heart is very, very full, and I'm so grateful to each of you for making this such a special evening. Um, books at the back table, Faith and Philip will be signing for those of you who might have questions for either one of them. Maybe you've got some questions for the good doctor. We thank you all for joining us. We will be back. It's, uh, I believe, five weeks from tonight. Uh, uh, April 28th for Youth Will Be Served. We have students from six different high schools. Um, we have a wonderful musician from the Westerly High School, and they will be um, guided during the day with their master teacher, Melanie Greenhouse. So we are looking forward to seeing you there. One more thing, if I could ask a favor, and we will send this out via email, um, the Arts Cafe Mystic was a recipient of a wonderful grant from the Connecticut Humanities Council. And one of the things they like to know is a little bit more of the demogra about the demographic of people supporting our events. So there will be a survey posted on the Arts Cafe Mystic website. For those of you who could remember, we will send a nudge. But it helps them know how they're helping us serve a broader community. Friends upstairs, so good to see you. Come down and grab another cookie for the road. We're so glad to have you here. 
and expecting to see you next month to see your peers, okay? Again, to my board, to each of you, to the great Margaret Gibson, um, who's done so much for the Arts Cafe. Uh, I really thank you for making the effort to come find us in our new home. Many thanks again, Dan.